Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Landor Seminar, Getting E-Scooter Trials Right. Uh, my name is Matthew Clark. Um, I'm uh, with STEER, the consulting group, um, and I lead our work in uh, our new university team. Um, I've got uh, experience working with local authorities and operators uh, on shared transport schemes for the last 10 years. I'd like to thank um, our sponsors today, DOT. Um, I'd like to thank Landor for organizing this session. Um, and just to let you know, we're going to have a number of panelists presenting, and then we'll move into a Q&A session at the end. So it'll be great if you can um, add questions using the question part of your uh, the functionality of the software as you're going through, and then we'll, we'll select some questions to ask to our panelists at the end. Um, I'm great to uh, welcome as many people we have on, on the call now. Uh, we're, we're nudging uh, 120 people now just coming in, so that's, that's great. Um, First of all, I'd like to apologize for the diversity on the panel, uh, and I'm hoping that the audience can add that diversity to what is a, a fast and growing sector. So before we start, I just want to uh, set the scene. Um, so the world of micromobility is a fast moving sector. The first shared e-scooters uh, were launched in Santa Monica in California back in September, 2017. Seems like a long time ago now. In the UK, our approach has been to use existing legislation which has not allowed to date for the use of e-scooters on the public road and shared e-scooters e therefore could not be legally launched. However, this was not through design or debate, simply the existing legislation. So to take you back to the days before COVID-19 and lockdown, pre-lockdown, uh, a government consultation was launched to take into account, uh, amongst other things, new forms of micromobility, including e-scooters. This was launched on the 16th of March. On the 9th of March, on the 9th of May, um, whilst the country, country was in lockdown, DFT uh, adopted and launched uh, the concept of e-scooter trials as a response to COVID. As you can see, the transport sector is in a moment of significant change. Previously, uh, the Department of Transport had been expecting uh, three or four locations to trial e-scooters as part of future transport zones in 2021. We're now in the situation where any local authority can apply to the DFT for a trial, with many in the process of securing an operator. So before we go to our first panelist, I'd just like to introduce the concept of um, a quick, quick, slow approach. So this is where we are. Local authorities have, have had to be very quick to decide whether to bid for an e-scooter trial. Operators have been very quick to respond to bids. Local authorities and operators and the DFT are currently being very quick to finalize trials and to implement schemes. Because of the speed of this, the way this is happening, these schemes will not be perfect. Some will fail, some will be a success. There will be unforeseen circumstances, but we will learn. And my view is that it's key to use this pilot period of 12 months to engage in considered learning to ensure that the next steps are informed and provide the best possible outcomes for cities, users and non-users. We need to learn from an extensive experience from operators and public authorities in established locations internationally. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, my panel, um, who you can see on the screen, and, our, um, and I'd like to go to our first panelist. So I'd like to introduce Anthony Ferguson, who is Head of Traffic and Technology, Department of Transport. Anthony, over to you. Good morning, hello. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. That was a comprehensive introduction and I don't really need to say anything else, um, but I will. Uh, so, the first uh, slide, if I just dive straight in, uh, and apologies um, uh, again for the diversity of the panel since we failed miserably here, um, but can I just point out that whatever I am, everyone else is, if they look like me, then they're the problem, not me, so just to get that out there. Um, so let's just dive straight in with some context. So if you can push on to the, the first substantive slide. Um, Matthew kind of alluded to this already. Um, there was pre-COVID, pre-trials, um, a regulatory review that was being undertaken as part of the future of transport. Uh, the, what was originally the future of mobility and became the future of transport grand challenge. Um, and this is a big undertaking where there was the call for evidence which went much wider than micromobility, but was the first attempt to uh, pull together evidence about the regulatory framework that existed and needed to exist to encourage um, new forms of transport and new approaches to transport. 
So the uh, micro mobility work stream was part of the regulatory review originally launched in March uh, with I think a 12 week um, turnaround. It was extended uh, because of COVID to July, so it's finished and it's now being considered. Um, it's also fair to say just in passing that um, as part of the work we did to stand up the trials, we did a short mm -hmm. consultation uh, specifically on e-scooters uh, kind of in parallel um, in order to inform the legislative changes we needed to make. Um, I think we had something like 2,000 responses in a couple of weeks, um, which is, shows the level of interest uh, of all um, types in the um, e-scooter e trials. So what, we, what we've been looking at with micromobility is that this much wider uh, range of new types of transport that, f that are part of micromobility, which tend to be, tends to be dominated by discussion about e-scooters, but clearly goes to a, a wider range of um, uh, types of uh, uh, transport. Um, actually, the, the pictures shown on the slide uh, are actually currently all uh, illegal forms of transport. So if you have one of these and are using it on the road, um, if you could hand yourself into the local police station, that would be uh, a great public service. Um, so what we are looking at is um, from things that we have seen coming for some time, like segways, which were um, considered by the department several years ago, uh, are new forms of transport evolving very fast um, and challenging the existing uh, legislative framework that we, we have today, both uh, national and international. Um, so. Uh, that's caused, um, uh, a, caused us to pose a number of questions about well, what do we do about this? How do we overcome the fact that there are new challenges, new forms of mobility arriving uh, all the time? Uh, and we have a fairly static legislative framework. So we wanted to look at um, both the vehicles themselves, um, which are in, and the design of those are evolving um, quite rapidly. Um, what, we, what we thought about them in terms of the people who would use them, uh, where they would go on the road, um, because that is that is where, for instance, we bump into the everyone's favourite, the um, 1835 Highways Act from William the Fourth's reign, uh, which is what determines uh, that vehicles can't go on pavements. Uh, uh, and then also looking at the business models that underpin the use of e-scooters, which are principally shared uh, scooters in, in most cities around the world. Um, so that was the context. That was the micromobility review that the, the call for evidence that happened. Uh, and we had in mind, as Matthew said, to run trials in due course. But we started off by trying to gather a comprehensive view of the kind of regulatory context. So if we push on to the next uh, slide. Um, so these are some of the, uh, the impacts that we are interested in, um, because I think it's fair to say that uh, views about scooters are are of uh, across the spectrum there are and you'll have followed this if you've followed the uh, transport select committee's inquiry into uh, into e-scooters um, there are those who are um, sort of vehemently for and there, there are those who are vehemently against and that's life in government you have got to try to satisfy a wide range of differing views and try and reconcile them as best you can. And the first thing you need to do is understand what is driving them what, and what they are. So the, the predominant concern we always have about road transport is around safety. Uh, the road is not a safe environment. Um, we already have vulnerable road users in the form of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, E-scooters are actually um, another vulnerable road user potentially because they are unprotected, they're going at relatively high speed and they're mixing with uh, other traffic. So uh, understanding what the sort of safety implications are of this new mode are very important. Um, uh, uh, there's an issue around um, uh, the design of the vehicle because obviously what we want to make sure is that uh, if e-scooters are to be used they, 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 need to be, they need to conform with some basic uh, sort of minimum requirements in terms of their ability to stop and start and, and not fall apart um, uh, to keep uh, the user safe but also to be able to stop so that um, uh, they're not colliding with other people or other vehicles. Um, we also are very interested uh, as part of that in the kind of accessibility and inclusivity um, uh, issues because the department published an inclusive transport strategy a few years ago. Um, it's, it's again it's, a, it's, a, it's an important driver uh, you know, transport is for everyone, 
mobility is for everyone and therefore we have to make sure that we balance uh, um, some quite difficult uh, contradictions in there particularly in the case of road transport which is it's a very hard environment to to regulate and manage in an operational sense um, because it's not a closed environment it's a very open environment uh, we're obviously interested in the environmental benefits because these are quiet uh, uh, green um, we think we want to know more about that but um, green forms of transport um, so for particularly in city centers that are plagued with uh, um, emissions problems and pollution uh, they, they hold that an, an opportunity and could support our drive towards decarbonisation um, we also are interested in how how a journey on a, an e-scooter or another form of micro mobility uh, would form part of a, a larger journey so that the end-to-end -end journey uh, which is interesting and related to that the um, what other choices might an e-scooter user be making so are they uh, using an e-scooter instead of uh, driving that probably gets you a thumbs up in the current climate um, or are they not uh, choosing not to walk or cycle or use a bus now in a covid world not using the bus maybe is a good thing because public transport when it's running at on average you know 50 percent capacity um, th this is precisely what drove us to look at these scooters in the short term um, was that actually uh, they provide an opportunity to kind of to relieve some of the pressure on public transport given that people want to start moving around uh, longer term uh, the future of mobility uh, principles that we published as part of our urban strategy uh, would have uh, active travel, public transport very high up the list. So we've, we're interested to know what would an e-scooter user otherwise be doing um, to ensure that we understand what the kind of benefits and possible disbenefits might be. Um, uh, and there's some practical kind of operational things which are very much at the local level about uh, what will happen to these vehicles, particularly rental shared scooters when they're not being used because um, we have, in fact, there is a picture coming up of uh, what has happened in the past. And we know from talking to many cities around the world that the early days of e-scooters, shared e-scooters were not trouble free. And that was something that we needed to look at. So that's a kind of quite a wide range of things that we're trying to uh, understand through the call for evidence and now through the trial. So if we skip on to the next uh, slide please. Uh, so the trials, um, yes they were due to start next year in a um, probably a kind of a, a, a limited number of places as part of our future transport zones uh, policy uh, but as a Covid response we've decided to, uh, to go much wider and open it up essentially to any uh, local area that wants to uh, participate and can um, get together with an operator and do a deal and uh, come up with a trial that meets our mm -hmm. specifications. So we passed regulations uh, in rapid, very rapidly to do the kind of the minimum necessary to overcome what is otherwise quite a complicated set of uh, regulations that um, make scooter use illegal at the moment. Uh, as a result, not everything about the way trials will be run are necessarily how we might want to do this in the future. We don't know, um, but there were certain things that we had to uh, that we had to leave. Otherwise, we would have been into um, the uh, area of having to um, change primary legislation, which is extremely difficult, very and very t uh, time consuming, uh, and not really conducive to a trial that we were trying to run uh, in a matter of weeks. Uh, so, for example, uh, users have to have a license, uh, albeit the uh, provisional license would be good enough. Uh, and that was something that we couldn't avoid without having to change the underlying primary legislation. So some things uh, like that um, are just an unnecessary uh, part of the way the trials have been uh, designed. Um, hopefully, uh, the trials will nevertheless tell us enough about uh, uh, how they are, how they're used, what what they're being used for, what people think about them, what non-users think about them, to answer the questions on the uh, previous slide and provide um, evidence. Uh, it's also the same reason why that the trials were limited to rental e-scooters, not private e-scooters, and there is um, obviously an issue with the fact that uh, uh, scooter sales have continued; um, they're not illegal to buy. Um, if you look closely at the disclaimers on all the websites uh, of companies selling them, you will see that they will tell you that they are not to be used on the road. But um, anecdotal evidence, i.e. me looking out of my window in North London, will tell you that there's quite a few people who haven't read that disclaimer. Um, 
So, and one of the other uh, key aspects here is about data and evidence, because this is what the trials are all about. They're not just a fun go at seeing what they're like. This is a, it's a very serious attempt by us to gather comprehensive evidence across a whole range of different air policy areas um, and gather evidence that frankly it doesn't really exist uh, in, in uh, uh, well it does exist I, I'll take that back it does exist but I don't think it uh, exists in the comprehensive way that we need in order to make the legislative decisions that are coming around the corner for us so should we jump on to the next slide it says slide 10, so don't worry, I took a few out clearly and didn't renumber. Um, so I've touched on this already. Uh, we are, as part of what we're doing, a very uh, core part of what we're doing is uh, the monitoring and evaluation framework that we've set up to uh, understand what the trials have told us. Um, so uh, we will be letting a central uh, contract, which we will run, which will run the central uh, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, activity and that is there in part to support the trials for us but also to support uh, uh, the local areas that are running trials because it's in part this is going to be useful to them as well as to us um, so we will be uh, through the evidence the monitoring and evaluation process we'll be looking at the the issues we've talked about earlier the impacts uh, that we're interested in around safety um, uh, mode shift um, and you know, the, the wider impacts that the introduction of scooters have in, in local areas uh, and what we're hoping is that we will gather together some, some really very world-leading uh, uh, evidence uh, underpinning our future decisions. So uh, if we move on to the next slide, he said with trepidation, the next slide says I have finished. So um, maybe just to sum up very quickly, uh, briefly, we uh, uh, have set around, set out uh, in a, a kind of long, a longer, slower process through the future of transport to understand micro mobility. The e-scooter trials being accelerated has been a huge challenge to the department um, because of the need to change legislation, to establish uh, the the frameworks that will underpin the the trials and clearly has created a massive amount of work, which we understand for local areas and for scooter operators, because there is a, a huge exercise going on for local areas to uh, do deals and come up with arrangements with, with operators to run their local trials, all within this national framework. And to do that from a standing start effectively from the 9th of May, uh, speaking as we are, well, it's less than uh, three months, uh, or is it four months? It feels like four years um, uh, has been has been a challenge, and we will, uh, as Matthew said, some will some will not necessarily succeed. Some might, some might even fail. Um, but that's the way trials are. Trials are there to discover, um, and so we want them to be real trials. So I will stop at that point and hand over hand back to uh, Matthew. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anthony. Um, very good overview there. Um, do remember that you can add your questions into the uh, question section on the uh, on the site, and we'll come back to those uh, bring everyone in. So next up, uh, we've got uh, two people from uh, DOT. We've got uh, very pleased to have the CEO and co-founder of DOT, um, Henry Mosinac, um, and he's also going to be joined by Duncan Robertson, who is the UK General Manager for DOT. So over to you two guys. Thanks very much. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, DFT and the, all the uh, uh, local authorities to be so proactive and accelerating these trials. Uh, I think this can make a change in the cities and we're going to show you some of the lessons learned. It's also very good to set up the trials in the right way so we can discover the new usage, how it's going to improve the cities and we measure improvements and we make sure that it's done in a proper way. So we're happy to share some of the lessons learned um, across the, the other countries we operate in. We operate about 20,000 scooters in 14 cities in Belgium, France, Germany, Italy and Poland. And uh, DOT is known to operate the service in a proper and orderly way. Specifically, we do 100% of all our operations in-house for maximum safety, transparency and accountability to the cities we partner with. On to the next slide. So what we see is that users want change. Uh, transportation is a pain. You can take a car, it's a nightmare. You can take public uh, transit, sometimes it's a nightmare. Next slide. 
and cities also want change. They want to fight pollution and carbon emission. So how can scooters help with that? Next slide. So what we see in other cities and what we hope to see in the UK is that typical change. Uh, this is a trip of about 20 minutes in public transit, 15 minutes when everything is okay with your own personal car, but it's going to be just an 11 minute trip on your personal bike or shared bike or your personal scooter or shared e-scooter. And on top of that, it's going to be virus free. And we see tremendous change in all the cities we operate with people moving on from their personal cars, moving on sometimes from public transit or doing multimodal trips, scooters and public transit in order to have a better life and just move faster across the city. Next slide. So what we see at first is the users, they see micromobility as a strong alternative to public transit. They can't take their car anymore. In most of the cities we operate in, private cars are almost forbidden. It's impossible to use. They love public transit. They love the affordability and the reliability of public transit. Sometimes it's too crowded and right now it's a bit fearful because of COVID. So they are looking for alternatives. Next slide. Midterm, we see the cities building bike lanes. This has been going on forever in cities like Paris, like London, like many other places. It's long-term investment for the last 10 years and it's going to continue. And now with COVID, we see many cities rushing temporary ones on top of the long-term planning. So better infrastructure will lead to better services. Next time, next slide. And long-term, we think micromobility has this opportunity to become the new car. So it's the personal freedom of a car without the, the hassle of parking it, owning it, the pollution with that. And when it's operated by third parties like us and other uh, e-scooter players, it provides the reliability and the affordability of public transit. And as such, e-scooters are not just a little toy, like some of the toys that Anthony showed in, uh, in his first slide. E-scooters have, have a chance to profoundly change the cities and bring that freedom with the reliability and affordability of public transit. Next slide. Duncan, do you want to pick it up from there? Yes, hello, thanks very much, Henry. Um, so how do we get e-scooter trials right? Before, we, before I talk about how we get it right, we need to have a little look, very little look, at, how, at what the impacts are of getting it wrong. So for cities, as discussed by um, Anthony and Henry as well, um, none of the benefits will be realised if we if we don't get this right, and we'll be taking a massive step backwards in terms of um, what what can be offered for the transport mix for for, for people in, in in cities and towns. The operators, I mean, failure is existential for us. If there are no scooters, there is no uh, industry at all. Uh, so we really do have one shot at getting this right and making sure that we uh, we, we provide a service that that uh, allows us to change uh, change the law and uh, and bring scooters to the to the wider community. So how do we get this right? So I'm going to set out some of our thoughts based on our experience in other cities in Europe. Um, these are the things that we think are totally fair for authorities and residents and visitors to want, let alone demand, uh, from scooter trials. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So the three main pillars that I'm going to discuss today are getting the service right, um, and we need to look at scooters as a mode of transport. Um, the second one is being orderly and tidy. We need to make sure that scooters are well managed. And the third one is socially responsible. Uh, we need to uh, realize these, these wide reaching, reaching benefits. Next slide, please. So first and always first uh, in getting the service right is thinking about safety. Um, the UK has a major opportunity as alluded to by, uh, by um, Anthony, that um, we can learn from what's happened over in the continent and the rest of the world. Um, that means that we have no excuse for not deploying the absolute best quality um, vehicles, the most robust vehicles for the trials. Um, there should be no short life vehicles permitted uh, in these trials and going forward. Um, but even the best hardware requires some maintenance and repair. Um, so operators must be able to demonstrate and deliver the quality, quality maintenance that's required to make sure that the fleet is always available. And that availability of fleet um, and good maintenance leads on to the next, uh, next part of this, which is making sure that scooters are always available. Um, scooters should be considered as a, as a, as a means of um, transport and a valuable addition to the transport mix. 
um, failure to provide scooters in the right places at the right time will turn people off in droves. Services need to be reliable. Lastly, on this slide, um, we need to provide uh, an affordable service. Um, pricing should be inclusive and provide a good range and a good uh, uh, extra range of choice um, from pay as you go uh, to just jumping on the scooter and paying as you go or to longer term packages, which can really help with the um, the change from um, from cars over to uh, over to micro mobility. Next slide, please. The second pillar is orderly and tidy. Scooters must be well managed, um, and a dedicated on street presence is an absolute must. Um, so first thing is dedicated parking. This is where cities and operators need to be collaborating exceptionally closely um, to identify parking provision to make sure that scooter riders have sensible and convenient options for parking their scooters. The second element is providing proper street operations. Um, this should be absolutely an expectation that operators have, uh, have on-street teams focusing on ensuring that the urban realm is not negatively impacted. Um, deploying scooters is really quite easy, um, but managing them into a service that works for all is very, very hard. In Lyon, uh, as a little example here, um, we collaborate with other operators in the city and have dedicated patrols that go around simply ensuring that scooters are well managed. And this is completely agnostic of operator as well. Um, thirdly, again, talked about already, uh, but data and sharing data uh, is essential to making scooter trials work. Again, a, an absolute expectation for cities is that data should be shared. They should not only be able to track what's going on in the, uh, in the environment um, uh, as is, but also provide insights into, um, into user behavior and behavior change. Next slide, please. The third pillar um, is socially responsible. Um, operators should be as inclusive as, uh, as possible, um, and this includes environmental impact. So for the first element um, uh, for, for the planet, it should be expected that city operations are zero emissions co uh, contributors. This is not only possible, but it's already happening. Um, operations can be entirely undertaken with um, electric vehicles, and there's no reason that this, uh, this shouldn't be uh, something that everyone um, uh, should provide and, and cities should expect. Um, so to maximize scooter availability and uh, significantly reduce the number of vehicle movements um, moving uh, scooters around, scooters should really have um, swappable batteries as well. Um, as mentioned before, scooter hardware must be really robust. We can learn from um, uh, the, the, the past in, in other places in, in, in the world. Um, the, the hardware that is available is um, just a completely different ball game to what it was maybe even 12 to 18 months ago. And we should be thinking about the lifespan of these vehicles, in, uh, of scooters, in terms of years and not months, which is exactly what we, what we do. Um, also for uh, employees, having scooters uh, in a city brings lots of local jobs. Um, and again, it should be an expectation from a city that all jobs should be from local communities. There's absolutely no reason to use the gig economy either. Um, people working in the scooter industry should uh, have be respected enough to be employed directly by, by operators. Um, and for the wider community, um, the service must be as must must be for everyone as much as possible. Uh, this includes non-riders. Um, non-riders, especially vulnerable uh, uh, road users, should expect scooter riders to know how to ride, where they can ride, where they can't ride, and how to park, amongst other things. Um, and all of this should be provided by um, operators in their in their education of of, of their riders. Um, so thanks very much. That's all from me. And we'll obviously pick up some questions at the very end, but I'll hand back over to Matt. Thanks very much, Duncan. Um, we've got some good questions coming in on the Q&A, so do keep those coming in. Um, now we're gonna uh, hand over to, uh, to Connor, uh, Connor Chaplin from TFGM. He has the um, delight of having the longest job title today, which is research, Innovation Research and Insight. Um, uh, officer, so with no further ado, uh, Connor, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks, Matt, and thanks again to Dot and Landor Links uh, for hosting the webinar, and of course to DFT for, I, I suppose, effectively being the reason that we're finally getting some of these scooters um, in the first place. Uh, so, as Matt mentioned, I'm an innovation officer at TFGM. 
um, which is the regional transport body responsible for uh, coordinating and delivering transport policy in Greater Manchester. Uh, it's an exciting time for us here. Uh, we've got an extensive cycling and walking programme ongoing, which includes uh, the B network and a bike hire scheme, which is due to go live next year. Uh, we're investing heavily in our infrastructure, um, which is including our uh, interchanges, bus stations, um, as well as Metrolink with the Trafford Park line opening recently ahead of schedule. Um, and we're also playing a leading role in tackling air pollution uh, and working towards our regional target to be carbon neutral by 2038. So the next slide, please. So Greater Manchester, um, we're one of the fastest growing economies um, and by 2040, that growth is going to mean around 200,000 more jobs in the region, uh, 3 million residents up from 2.7 million today, uh, and at least 200,000 more homes. And all of that means approximately 600,000 more journeys being made every day in Greater Manchester. Uh, to, su to support that growth, um, we're going to need a cohesive integrated transport system. Um, and we believe that our commitment to both innovation and that economic growth is what really makes Greater Manchester the ideal place to be trialling uh, and implementing new mobility solutions. Next slide, please. Now, this growth uh, does present us with some significant challenges, namely how do we get to 600,000 more journeys a day um, without increasing transport emissions? Uh, so in answer to this, uh, we've developed uh, the Greater Manchester Transport Strategy 2040, which sets out how we'll achieve that. Um, and one of the key points from that strategy is what we call the right mix vision. Uh, and the right mix vision is essentially our target for modal mix in the region. Um, the main takeaway from that is 50% of journeys by 2040 need to be made by sustainable modes, which as you can see by our graphic there, means 1 million more sustainable journeys per day than what we're currently at. Back to the next slide, please. Uh, and to get there, we're going to need, as I mentioned, a highly integrated world-class transport system. Uh, and this then actually sets out a world-class, oh, sorry, a holistic approach to that. Um, which allows us to support sustainable economic growth whilst developing an innovative city region, um, all while protecting our environment with the ultimate goal here of um, improving quality of life for all by making travel easier. Next slide, please. So in support of that transport strategy, uh, this is our network, uh, which you might have seen launched by the mayor, or as we've affectionately come to call it, the Death Star. Um, and this aligns with the 2040 strategy and shows a high level plan of how transport modes uh, could work together to create that single cohesive network in the region. Um, and part of that increased connectivity will be embracing new mobility systems and modes and understanding how they fit into the existing transport provision we have. Uh, over the past few years, transport at CFGM has built a portfolio of innovative mobility projects um, from mobility service to connected and autonomous vehicles and also now starting to look at 5G digital communications um, and urban air mobility. Uh, some of those projects have been really successful, some less so. Uh, but as Anthony mentioned, for those kind of projects, success um, is really in learning what the sticking points are. Um, and I think that's why I'm so pleased to see these e-scooter trials being brought forward. Um, so at TF TFGM at least, we absolutely see micro-mobility as a really important part of the future network and ensuring that we can support sustainable growth. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the opportunity that we, the biggest opportunities we see um, in our region, and I imagine these are probably fairly similar for lots of local authorities um, and other transport bodies in the UK, um, particularly in the short term, uh, e-scooters provide a really ideal solution for those shorter trips that are unsuitable for public transport at the moment um, due to their distance, but also importantly, the capacity challenges we have at the moment due to social distancing. Um, I mentioned the right mix vision earlier, which has that goal of 50% of journeys being made by sustainable modes. Uh, and we believe that e-scooters um, could potentially replace a number of uh, journeys being made by single occupancy cars. There's no fixable solutions to achieve that right mix vision, but we think e-scooters are going to be a valuable tool to get there, um, as well as other micro mobility and new mobility systems. And a big part of that is also working towards carbon neutrality. Um, so obviously electric motors are considerably more efficient than internal combustion engines. Um, and that becomes, again, quite significant if we're moving away from, um, if we see a significant modal shift away from cars. The trials are also really great, uh, the trials in particular are a really great opportunity to understand how micro-mobility schemes like this um, can integrate with our existing transport provision. Um, with more active geofencing, um, the form factor of e-scooters as well. I, I think we've come a long way since our experience in the region with micro-mobility hire schemes in 2017. 
Um, it'll be really interesting for us to explore those commercial models and what the arrangements are of local authorities um, to manage those schemes. Most of the operators we've spoken to so far um, seem to be adopting a co-creation approach with the local authorities, which is really encouraging given it is ultimately those authorities that have the best understanding of the local economies and the local transport issues. Um, and these trials also give us an opportunity to see what the impact might be, uh, in particular for us on our bike hire scheme, um, which is launching in the spring. We'll also be monitoring whether these scooters could potentially act as a stepping stone, stepping stone for active travel, cycling in particular. Um, from our travel surveys, we know that there's uh, a lot of people in the region, particularly in the wake of COVID-19, that um, really want to get out and about more, but they lack either the confidence or fitness to make that step change. Um, so e-scooters are potentially a way to allow those people to get familiar with our cycling infrastructure and build confidence to move more permanently to cycling. And finally, um, probably the biggest one for us is enhancing both intermodal and first class mile connectivity. First class mile connectivity in particular um, it is a challenge for us uh, given the geography of our region um, and it's where we see the most benefit for e-scooters, uh, giving passengers greater flexibility to easily connect to our transport hubs um, without that reliance on their cars. Right, next slide please. Obviously there's some risks as well, uh, which I'm hoping to get a better understanding of through these trials. Um, perhaps Anthony can correct me, but I suspect having e-scooters fully legalised isn't too far off. Um, so these trials are a really great opportunity for us to get an early start on understanding those risks and how to mitigate them. Um, so these are the main concerns that have been raised by both local authorities and elected members in the region. Uh, the big one is obviously safety. Uh, first up to the safety of the e-scooter users, given the helmets aren't a legal requirement and they'll be used on the roads, so they'll face all the same dangers that cyclists currently face. Uh, and we also have to consider the safety of pedestrians. Uh, in particular, uh, our concern is about those with impaired vision or restricted mobility um, at crossings. And I think realistically, although they might not be legal on pavements, we have to accept that some users probably are going to try and jump onto pavements. We have to understand how we manage that. Um, so whether that's rewardable warnings, lighting, user education and training, um, and also understanding how the scooters are actually deployed and balanced across the region, where they're parked up and so on. Um, with the touch on carbon emissions, we do need a better understanding of uh, the full life cycle impact of e-scooters. Um, we know that, let's say, that they're, they're more efficient than an internal combustion engine, but there are other factors to consider, such as how they rebalance. It obviously won't be preferable at all for us to find ourselves in a situation where we tout the green benefits of these vehicles, to then find we've got a bunch of diesel vans roaming around the city uh, to rebalance them. Um, in touch on pedestrians and street clutter, which is also partially linked to market oversupply. Uh, really important for us that local authorities retain some control, whether it's through a permit scheme or otherwise. Um, what we're very wary of is these scooters being fully legalised without provision for that local control, uh, which could lead to oversupply um, and then these scooter operators arbitrarily pulling their vehicles out of the region, which um, would be the opposite of that cohesive transport network I mentioned. And finally, is the possible impact uh, on our existing transport infrastructure. Um, what we really want to avoid is e-scooters cannibalising active travel journeys, um, particularly given uh, the priority that is for us in terms of health in the region. Um, and similarly, we're also already experiencing significant pressure on revenue for bus fetching, for example, as a result of COVID-19. So we need to be aware of that impact um, and understand how we can make schemes commercially viable, not just for themselves, but uh, commercially viable in the context of the wider transport network as well. Uh, the next slide, please. So finally, our approach to Greater Manchester. Um, we want to build our new mobility project portfolio. Um, we've been quite successful with some of the projects we've run over the past five years or so, uh, and e-scooters, of course, are a part of that. Um, we were one of the shortlisted areas for the future transport zones, but unfortunately unsuccessful. However, we want to implement as much of that proposal uh, as we can, and a key component of that was bike mobility, uh, and also adopting a place-based approach where we're really considering uh, the impact of our mobility interventions at a more localised level. So identifying how those interventions can support different kinds of journeys in the conurbation, uh, again, considering the quite different geographies, demographies and travel markets we have here. Um, so instead of going out for a region-wide scheme, we're supporting local authorities to develop a number of schemes in the region that address the specific needs of those areas. I think one of our strengths uh, as a whole is the investment we put into um, safer cycling infrastructure in the region um, through the B network. Um, for example, the Oxford Road Corridor, which is one of the main routes through the city, now having fully segregated Dutch style cycle lanes. Um, we also recently completed the UK's first Cyclops Junction um, that considerably reduces the conflict between cyclists and traffic. 
um, and also at a regional level we'll be considering how these e-scooter schemes could um, integrate into a future wider mass ecosystem. Um, and as part of that place-based approach we really want to put local authorities in control so at CFGM we're drawing on our experience with these kind of trials but we're acting in advisory roles to LAs and coordinating the activity between them so we're advising on the design implementation and in doing so we produce quite detailed uh, research briefings um, for micromobility in general and specifically in trials for those LAs um, and we're also providing advice for governance of their relationship between the operators um, particularly the protections we feel are necessary to ensure that whilst the trials bring as much benefit as possible to those areas um, the risks are also mitigated uh, effectively. And finally, um, we'll also be coordinating the monitoring and evaluation scheme across the region. Um, so as mentioned, each of the schemes we're proposing will have slightly different um, aspects to it. So we want to coordinate that monitoring and evaluation uh, at the regional scale so we can share that best practice across the board. Um, our particular focus will be on mobile shift, types of journeys being made and how much e-scooters are promoting that intermodal and first class mile connectivity. Um, and part of that is also working with some of the universities in the region to build in some independent academic research. University of Suffolk in particular, um, we've been quite interested to work with building on some of the work they did previously in their evaluation of uh, the mobile scheme. Um, so we're currently working with several local authorities on different schemes, as I mentioned. Generally, they're all adopting a phased approach um, to these trials. Um, we'll be starting small, scaling up, depending on how things are going and making sure that we can properly address the concerns of uh, the local stakeholders and the public and ensuring that um, uh, supply is appropriately matched to demand as well. Um, I think the important thing for all of these trials, which I'm sure would be the same for any of the authorities working on this, uh, is ensuring that we remain agile, both us and the operator, um, so that we can quickly react to how the trials are developing, um, to any issues arising, or possibly as well some um, opportunities that are presenting themselves. Uh, so that's, that's just about it from Greater Manchester. Thank you. Thanks very much, Connor. Um, if, and last but not least, we have Conrad Haig, who is uh, Solent uh, Transport Manager from Solent Transport. Um, then we will go into a Q&A session. Uh, over to you, Conrad. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and thank you to uh, Lambda and Dot for organising this. Um, <clears throat> good morning, all. Um, I hope you're well and keeping safe. Um, bear with me, this is my first proper webinar. Obviously, we've all got used to Teams over the, over the last few months, but uh, um, this is my first uh, virgin webinar, as it were. So I'm Conrad Haig, I'm the Solent Transport Manager. I'm gonna say a little bit about Solent Transport because I should imagine that not everybody knows uh, where we are or what we do. Um, so if we could have the next slide. Oh, and the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna minimize this because I can't see my screen. Oop, I pressed the wrong button. Bear with me. Sorry, one moment. I've got the, uh, do bear with me just a second. Let's move that other way, okay. All right, um, so Solent Transport, uh, we're a fairly thin slip of land in an island, uh, a set of peninsulas on the south coast. Um, we are a transport partnership. Um, Solent Transport represents the Hampshire County Council, Isle of Wight, Portsmouth and Southampton City Councils. Um, we are a small piece of real estate but a very important and very densely populated um, sort of piece of land as well. Um, we are part of Transport for the South East and we represent 20% of the population of Transport for the South East. We have several major international gateways, ports and ferry ports, um, and we provide a lot of the um, in, uh, the materials for the uh, in industry in the UK, particularly the Midlands and the North. So um, it's going to be a really interesting place in terms of post-Brexit uh, transport planning. Uh, we also have quite a, a vast um, amount of academia so we have three universities across uh, across the region and sort of a, it's a very challenging place to do an interesting place to do transport policy. Um, we have every form of transport you could possibly want from drones to other craft and everything in between. So um, an interesting place to do work. We transport, uh, Solent Transport has a number of uh, public facing uh, products, um, not least it's uh, got a 
smart card and a my journey which is a behavioral campaign so we have both strategy policy and a sort of public facing delivery though we do rely on heavily and uh, our very close working relationship with our local transport authorities so oh next slide please so a little bit more about the e-scooter so we are a future transport zone um, and we're very pleased to have been nominated uh, to be awarded the future transport zone um, thank you very much anthony and the rest of the dft for that um, we didn't have e-scooters as part of our original bid but we have developed it as a response to covid uh, and some of our concerns around public transport the area is traditionally quite a low usage of public transport area and covid has really impact on that um, we also have um, all our councils have are in the process of doing so or have announced climate change emergencies so the low use of public transport is a real concern in uh, a covid response and we're trying to utilize the e-scooter tree uh, to, um, sort of trial as part of the response to that uh, that issue can i have the next slide please so we are one trial um but we have four sub projects um we have one based in winchester um around park and ride um, portsmouth the park and ride and access to a business park uh, southampton is a park and ride and the isle of wight is a little bit different and i'll say a little bit more about that uh, later um, in the fact that it's about it's focused around visitors and access to ferries can i have the next slide please so just a bit of an overview uh, we have submitted a uh, a bid to the DFT went last week. Uh, we're obviously hope, waiting with bated breath and hope that uh, the DFT is pleased with it as we are uh, and, and hope that we meet their criteria. It is across the area. We are looking for doing to do this across our entire area and we are seeing this as something that we could develop in the future. So this is very much a trial, not something we're looking to learn from, but something that we, we really see as having a potential subject to its success and the monitoring and evaluation that comes back from lo both locally and from national DFT um, evidence. We have three trails oriented around park and ride. That matters because uh, one of the prerequisites for utilizing these scooters at the moment is a, is a driving license, so that works well with that. Uh, and we are trying to really think about the issues around both the criteria and how people will use this and the usability. Behavioral change, and usability and the customer journey are front and foremost of our FTZ and the way that we see work developing in, in, in solar transport. So we are seeing this as a key issue within the delivery of our e-scooter work. I mentioned ones around the business park, that's in, in, in Portsmouth, the, uh, uh, and the others around uh, ferry trails and, and tourism in the south, uh, in, in um, the Isle of Wight. So our concepts really about aimed about delivering against uh, a variety of local transport needs, um, not least relieving public transport in a uh, post-COVID world, um, which is a significant concern to us, and particularly in reducing carbon within our city centres through delivering these at park and rides um, and providing a way of uh, keeping as many cars as we can out of the city centres. Um, and it's a major concern to us, particularly, particularly as you remember that one of our cities is the historical capital of the uh, of England and uh, has got quite a lot of quite um, valuable history and sort of um, sort of um, ancient monuments in it. Um, so we're also um, looking at trying to keep as many of these as possible off carriageway. That's not to say we won't have any at all on carriageway, but where there are other ways of uh, utilizing mechanisms of uh, existing cycleways, we are looking at trialing that. Um, and we've got a fair big mixture of uh, different var variations, but our, our orientation is to de develop these up in a, I think I've heard this before in previous uh, presentations, um, starting small and developing up um, um, to a, a bigger scale over time. Um, understanding, watching and learning all uh, as we go. 
and this is partially to address both road safety issues, concerns by stakeholders um, and local residents about this new form of transport, which I think will take a little bit of getting used to, uh, but if we do it sensitively and in a way that is productive, I think we can we can manage that transition. Um, and we've developed a number of schemes which have scope to grow, um, even beyond the scale which we're talking at this present moment in time, um, because like DFT, we want to see this from trialers and we are prepared to stop them should uh, that be required. However, we do want the ability to grow these should they be successful and see them as part of an integrated transport um, network. Could I have the next slide, please? So, Solent trials guiding principles. We're trying to experiment. You know, this is a trial. We're a future transport zone. We see uh, development, understanding, and learning as a key part of that. Uh, and we really want to fulfill that remit, uh, get as much out of it as we can for the Solent area, get as much out of this as we can for the Department for Transport, get as much of it out as we can for the entire. Um, transport network of the UK and per perhaps beyond by, beyond by learning and understanding the different mechanisms and approaches. So we're going to test two procurement approaches. One is the uh, very popular, I think, sub zero concession, which we will be doing on the Isle of Wight, which is orientated around visitor use uh, and access to ferry ports mainly. Um, and we will see what approach that uh, that leads to. But we're also looking in the other three projects to provide potentially some CECOM funding to see how we can develop the delivery of a service product around e-scooters that will be um, distracted, will, will be developed with the, you know, the user and the need in mind, uh, not distracted by commercial pressures uh, to the same degree. So we're seeing how that develops and see which one of those procurement measures seems to um, provide the best options going forward. We're looking to learn as we go. Um, we have the incremental approach. I think, as I said, we've heard that before, and I think it's a very sensible approach. There's a lot of people very worried about what e-scooters might be. Uh, there's also a lot of people very excited about what the options are, and I think we've got to make sure that we do this in a way that people get a chance to adapt and develop. We don't want to just dump them all in a town centre and hope, that, hope for the best, because we have a plan for these as part of the strategic transport network, and we want to make sure that we are allowing for the behavioural change of adapting and understanding how to utilise them. Um, we want to be agile. Um, we don't, we're not set to one particular uh, delivery, although we are concerned about road safety and we are concerned about how people might use us and what restrictions can be used either electronically or through other modes or through you know using docks or dockless uh, or electronic docking systems. We want to make sure, I think one of the guiding principles of one of the previous conversations was about sort of keeping them in, in, in certain areas and keeping them tidy and, uh, and we certainly, would, that is a concern for us. Uh, but we want to understand the merits of each each approach. Um, and finally, as I said, we're FTZ, so we're looking to understand how this works and how it fits into an overall integrated transport environment, and we want to share that as part of it. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So just a little bit about the, the time scales and scales of the development. Um, the Isle of Wight will be going first. Um, we're looking to launch that in around September. Um, and uh, that will be closely followed by Portsmouth City Council uh, uh, scheme, which will, will come out in October. Hampshire will hopefully uh, follow shortly afterwards uh, in November, uh, around the orientated around the park and ride. Um, if you think we're slightly obsessed with that, that's because um, we have quite a lot of park and rides in this area, particularly in Winchester. I think there's about five off the top of my head. Uh, and the reality of it is that access to the city our environmental transport modes will be interesting as a, a concept. We are planning to trial these alongside other modes of sustainable transport, so higher bikes, higher electric bikes. Um, so we want to understand not just how they will fit in and deliver as an e-scooter, but how they are favoured and understood and used against other potential options. Um, and of course, Southampton. Southampton's coming in the new year, um, and the reason for that is because our preferred site for this is a park and ride, um, which is highly utilised by the um, NHS and, and the University of Southampton, potentially we could expand the trial too, um, but um, it's presently being used as a COVID test centre and we won't get it back until uh, 
later in the uh, well, early in the new year. So development of that site isn't really an option at this present moment in time. So overall, we are looking to try and develop a scheme up to around 700 e-scooters across the area. Um, it could go further than that should it be successful, but that's our ambition at this present moment in time. I think that's a significant amount of scope. Uh, and of course, the varying aspects of this to understand and learn how this can be used in different environments, different areas, in different ways, using different procurement processes um, is key to, to our delivery. Um, we understand and are prepared that this is a trial um, and that the DFT may ask us to take it out, but they also say, may say it's very successful and please uh, push on with your delivery. So we've left scope for both of those scenarios in our delivery um, and you know, we'd be very pleased uh, with the, to develop this subject to it being successful. Um, I think there's a little, the table underneath gives a little bit more detail about scale and, uh, of each site, but I won't dwell on that now. Could I have the next slide, please? Just before I go onto this slide, I just want to say that all the pictures we've got there are representative and we are going through a procurement process. Um, so um, they are just there as representations. We have no, we, 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 we are at the, the correct spa uh, space to, to actually deliver this, but um, we're not in any way biased towards any procurement uh, delivery. Um, so um, do try to refrain from questions around that um, when asking us um, any questions later on. Um, Obviously, we're waiting for the DFT response. Um, I hope they're as excited as we are about this and uh, as positive. And um, we, uh, we wait with bated breath, Anthony. Um, developing and the approach to marketing communications, I think will be key. I've kind of said how important behavioral change, marketing and delivery and the customer journey are to us. Um, and so we've got a lot of work to do there, but we're, 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 all, we're, we're working on that at this present moment in time. And the monitoring and evaluation of the trial, um, whilst we will, of course, be completely adhered to the DFT's uh, process, we will also be doing our own because we're a future transport zone and we see that as key to our delivery. So um, I think like everyone else, we're watching everybody, what everybody else is doing and trying to learn from them as we go. Um, but um, we've already done quite a lot of that, actually. We've been, even um, had conversations with Abu Dhabi about their scooter trials um, and the, 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 those in the Emirates. And um, yeah, we're keen to progress this. And I think that's probably it for me now. Um, thank you very Thanks much. Very much Colin. Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I invite our panelists to uh, come up to the podium by means of turning your video on? <laughs> it's all very new, isn't it? <laughs> There we go. Okay, excellent. Right. Um, so here we go. We're all here together. Um, so we've had lots of questions from the audience. So we now have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to start with a quite broad question. Um, and I'm going to ask this one, probably I'm going to start um, by asking Dot to respond to this, so either Henry or Duncan, and um, possibly Connor might be able to add to this. Uh, from TFGM's experience. So uh, the question is, what has already been learned from existing e-scooter trials that are underway? Now, I don't think we mean e-scooter trials in the UK as we don't have that many yet, but perhaps some international experience or something from um, experience with uh, Dr. Spikes maybe. Henry, maybe, uh, maybe you might be well placed with your uh, international presence. Sure, sorry, I was looking for the button. So I, I think Duncan really highlighted the, the key three points. The first one is you really need to build the right service. Otherwise, users are unhappy, they don't use it, and it just becomes litter in the street. It needs to make an impact for end users. And that's a combination of having hardware that is good, safe, and properly maintained. It's always available, and it's at affordable prices. The second thing, it needs to be operated in a tidy and orderly way, uh, specifically where it's parked, how it's maintained in the street, and how it's integrated in the wider ecosystem. For example, public transit, uh, mass applications, and other uh, data services from the city. And the third one, it needs to be done in a socially responsible way. For the planet, everything needs to be carbon neutral, and we need all scooter operators 
all service providers to pay attention to that. This is extremely important. If it's not helping the planet, we shouldn't be doing that. It needs to be responsible towards the employees and the people are going to be industries doing that. They need to be properly employed and it needs to be responsible towards all the people are not going to use it. And specifically pedestrians that don't want to see that litter, the scooters litter the, the, the sidewalks. Thanks very much. And um, Connor, um, with um, TFGM's experience um, with dockless bikes, is there anything you'd like to add from uh, from TFGM? Yeah, so I completely agree with everything Henri said. Um, and then, as you say, we have a little bit of experience um, from when we had the free floating dockless scheme in Manchester in 2017. Um, and I think also looking at what's happened in Paris and how they've adapted their model recently, um, and also how the, the Germans have had quite a clear path on how they're managing micro-mobility schemes um, from the start. I think the most important things for us are, as Comrade mentioned, make, making sure that supply is correct. Um, so the last thing we want to see is um, them flooding the market, because uh, I think that's probably one of the things that sticks in people's minds, particularly for citizens of those cities. Um, they've got, so one of the first things they mentioned is seeing them all fallen over in the street, blocking pavements and that kind of thing. Um, and part of that is, has to be targeting how you're rebalancing them more effectively so i think working closely with the local authorities is really important i mean naturally i'll say that as i work for a local authority that we want to control but they really are the ones who understand where those pinpoints are in the region where the hot spots are where we maybe don't want to see scooters piling up and maybe where we really need them to be um, so working closely with the local authorities and also community involvement um, if you really want to encourage modal shifts and behavioral um, change i think that the community needs to feel like they are part of the scheme, they have a say in it. Um, and I think that, that really helps also to address some of the vandalism issues as well. If, if they feel like it's their scheme rather than something that's being imposed upon them, um, it, it can address some of those vandalism issues. Um, and also it makes it a little bit easier um, to then expand the scheme uh, if people are on board because uh, of how it's being managed. Thanks very much. Um, Anthony, I've got a question for you. Um, this is regarding um, some uh, some press reports from what's been happening in Middlesbrough. So Middlesbrough is clearly the, the place of interest at the moment, or Teesside certainly, with the, the early trials there. Um, someone has commented that um, some users are maybe a, a little young to be using these scooters and uh, 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 bypassing the requirement for a driving license. Um, do you think that this, um, that what's set up is, is, is currently uh, going to be a problem in, in forthcoming trials or is there something that uh, local authorities can do or operators can do to try and uh, resolve this? Yes, there is. Uh, so the, the first trial area, particularly because they, they went quickly, I think was always at risk. I mean, the, the chances of something not, not going exactly to plan was very high. They were the first to do it, and they, so they've had to learn for others. Um, I think it is fair to say that some of the most recent media coverage is essentially micro microwaved mm -hmm. and heated up from two weeks ago, so it's, yeah. it's not as bad as, as they're making out. There were, I think there were some issues in the first week or so. Uh, so, and the good thing is, I think the operator and the local area local authority have got together and they've worked out what the problems are and they've worked through some solutions. And so the next trial that comes along will benefit from that. So there were some issues, I think, around um, license verification. That's a tricky, it's a tricky issue because we, we realize that the, the more steps and layers you build into the process, the harder it is, the, the less attractive it is for users. But you know, there, it, it is necessary that for us to be sure that the people, and for the operators for that matter, because it's their, their equipment, is being used uh, by the right people in the, in the right way. And I think they have done a number of things, uh, sort of softer interventions as well, by having um, ambassadors who are kind of out on the street, sort of making this work. And it, go, it goes to some of the points that Henri and Duncan and actually Connor were talking about, you know, about the, um, how, to make, how to make trials successful. It's more, than, it's more than just the kit, it's more than the data, it's all of the component bits have to fit together. So I think the kind of long and short of it is that there's been there's been a couple of stumbles probably in the in, with the first one, but if anyone didn't think that was going to happen, then I don't know uh, why they thought that because we fully expected some some stumbles to start with. It's it's a difficult thing to do in a hurry. Thanks very much, um, Conrad. I'd like to bring you in on this one. So um, just. Any, any thoughts about how, as you're going through a procurement, you might be able to uh, manage uh, the sort of issue of, of younger people using these scooters? 
And the second one is, is a question from somebody else, which is, is more about the wider use of e-scooters. So the point at which we have uh, shared e-scooters uh, being trialed, um, is the genie out of the bottle? And um, are you concerned about enforcement of, about the wider use of e-scooters in private ownership? So let's take the first one first. I mean, as soon as the, uh, and, and, and to be fair to uh, Middlesbrough, they shared that with uh, the group, which is organized by the DFT instantaneously, and we all knew about it very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, my team will tell you that the first thing that happened after that phone, after that conference was me on the phone saying, right, we need to make sure this doesn't happen. How do we do that? And we will all learn from each other. I mean, quite frankly, it was very good of Middlesbrough to share that information and in such a proactive way. None of us will get all of this right the first time. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we, we talked about being agile, developing and learning. That's what we've got to do. Um, and, you know, <laughs> it's not our turn to have the mistake. It will be soon. Uh, and hope that you can all learn from our mistakes too. Um, we will, and we'll hope to learn from all of yours. I think there's there's just one of those things. I think you've got to make sure that you can adapt that. We're going for a procurement process. Actually, that is in our procurement process because we learned from it, and there'll be other things that are in there as well. Um, we've learned from bike trials in the past. So we had a, an undocked bike trial, which is a major concern to us about how e-scooters might replicate that, the, the experience we had with that. Um, that wasn't the best experience. And, you know, there are places, and, and Winchester particularly is one of them, where we will get a lot of local criticism if uh, these are just left around the general environment of the, the historical capital with all the beautiful architecture and things like that that we have there. So we've got to be sensitive. We've got to try and manage those processes. And we've got, you know, it, 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 we will all learn but none of us will get it right. And I think that's why we're working as a team and that's why DFT has set the group up to make sure that, that happens. In terms of the uh, the general use of e-scooters, I mean, they're available now. They are being used. We've seen some in our area. I know that they've been quite prevalent in uh, London and in the TfL area. I'm sure that's the same for Manchester. Um, you know, it's better that we're doing these trials, that we have a pro proactive way of managing this process, that we've been thinking about how we can make the viability work uh, and how the user groups work. I think the licensing thing is a very sensible thing for the DFT to have done um, to make sure that we've got the right users using them in the right way. You, you're always going to have this risk. Uh, if you don't want any risk, don't travel because there's nothing in transport that's risk free. I mean, elevators, I think, is the safest, but and I, I, I think. We'll just got to work through it. We're working closely with our police to make sure that they're aware. Uh, they have limited resources, so how much they'll be able to do, we don't know. But it, it is a case of managing that risk and doing everything you can in the process to manage that risk. I, I'm, I just minded of something that someone said to me, who's not a transport expert, but a friend of mine, and he said, if motorbikes were invented today, would we, you know, would they ever get on the road? I don't know, but we manage a lot of dangerous things on our roads. Uh, and we're doing a lot on safety to make sure that's managed really, really well. Um, but, you know, if you want everything to be risk free, you just not to walk, not to travel at all. And so we have to make sure that we are moving forward, taking the opportunities that these these vehicles provide us in terms of an integrated transport system, but managing that to the greatest degree that we can. Thanks very much. Um, question now for Duncan, um, and might open up a bit after that. This is regarding to um, where trials should be managed, so whether it should be at uh, which which level of local authorities. Um, so those of us who are familiar with uh, previous um, shared shared schemes, such as Doctor Spikes, um, places that have many authorities, such as London, um, it's been a bit of a challenge um, with uh, individual authorities managing the schemes rather than it being more cohesively managed at a city level. Um, do you, Duncan, do you have any views about how that might be uh, work in the interests of both users and, and, and the services themselves? Yeah, absolutely. So I think for, for cities with multiple authorities like uh, London and Manchester, definitely having a, a kind of higher level view of, uh, of, of the management is, is preferable from an operator's perspective, but also from a user perspective. Certainly in London, I, I've got a lot of experience in the bike share world in, in London and having kind of arbitrary boundaries, or not arbitrary, but borough boundaries, which means you can go to a boundary, but then you can't go over it, is really problematic from a, from a user perspective. Um, so for a city with, as I say, with lots of authorities, then keeping that contained and managed at a higher level is, is, is preferable. 
Um, and that leads to the desire to really have a city managed as one. So cities where there is one local authority, and maybe it doesn't extend all the way up to combined authorities, but let's let's make sure that the local authority is having um, a certain amount of, uh, of input is, is also important. So we mustn't devolve too high or, or devolve too low um, uh, the, the, the control over, over, these, uh, over these trials, uh, to specifically learning from bike share as well. Um, maybe Connor, um, do, do you have any thoughts on that? From uh, so you're obviously uh, uh, from that that high level authority. Uh, does that uh, kind of chime with things that you're thinking, or, or something different? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, like Duncan says, it has to be without copping out the question. It does have to be a mix of the two. Um, I mean, we're, we're quite lucky in Greater Manchester that I think we're quite joined up as a region. So we work, we do work quite closely with those local authorities. Um, we've got several working groups and strategy groups that make sure all of those local authorities are aware of what's going on um, at that regional level. Um, but again, it's, it's really important to deliver that cohesive network, not forgetting that this is the end user's experience that is ultimately what we're trying to deliver and you know, not getting tied up with just our own local government issues. Um, so we've got some experience of that with the bike hire scheme. Um, so, so that's a, a standalone program um, within the cycling and walking um, program that it is managed through one of those strategy boards. Um, so we have representatives from the relevant local authorities sitting on that board. So they're very involved um, at an officer level and also local members are involved in site selection and that kind of thing. Um, so it, yeah, it, it does have to be a combination of both. I think in terms of delivering the user experience, you do need that uh, regional or city-wide leadership um, to, to present that united front. Um, but when you're getting down into the detail of site selection, how the scheme's going to operate, that kind of thing, you do need to be working with those local authorities. Because as I mentioned earlier, that they really do have the best understanding of the local issues they have. Thanks very much, Connor. Um, Anthony, uh, a further one for you. Um, so someone's asked about the relationship between um, micromobility and public transport. So um, clearly one of the reasons for bringing forward these e-scooter trials was to provide a way of people getting around where public transport capacity is more limited due to COVID. Um, how do you foresee um, e-scooters or micromobility and public transport working um, in, in the longer term? Is there a synergy or is it a competition? Well, discuss. Um, <clears throat> we don't. We don't know. I guess is the problem. The the problem we have is that uh, if we if we'd done this last year, I could probably give you a more coherent answer. COVID has thrown everything into uh, confusion because um, <clears throat> it's a point that people have made to us, and it's a fair point, uh, which is that uh, you know what are we benchmarking against? You know what's our baseline now? Because there's no point in talking about you know uh, how things used to be because they're not how they used to be. They've changed. And what nobody knows yet is what a post-COVID recovery looks like, how long it'll take, whether there, there are any permanent changes to the way people are going to travel. Um, I have read some kind of interesting uh, summaries of what happened in the, in the Far East after the SARS epidemic, um, which suggested that people went back to driving as soon as they were allowed to. Um, so it is, it is difficult to predict, um, and it does make some difficulties for us in terms of the evaluation of knowing quite COVID has created an unusual set of circumstances. So um, actually, how you how you kind of work work out what that means longer term is is quite difficult. Um, <clears throat> I guess what we're hoping is that the trials will be long enough and the evidence will be clear enough that um, over time we will start to see if, if the recovery goes uh, you know the way we would like it to and public transport usage goes back up and the economy starts to uh reopen fully um we i think we will get a clearer answer to that but at the moment it, it, it is difficult as i said earlier i mean ideally what we want is you know in a, particularly in a kind of an, an urban center i think Henri made this point you know what we're looking for are, are ways of getting around that are that meet our uh, economic and environmental and social objectives um you know i guess we're Kind of relaxed about what they might be and they may they may vary from place to place it may be that conrad and connor have slightly you know and their politicians maybe have a slightly different take on what they consider to be um you know the right answer to that question um but what we are definitely going to because the, uh, the other variable in this is of course that public transport isn't static either so the vehicles that provide public transport now are looking different to the vehicles that i used to deal with when I did bus policy 10 years ago and in 10 years time they'll probably look different again so again what you know what the there is nothing there is nothing static about the road tra transport environment um, but what we are looking for 
is things that are overall ideally a net benefits so they're net improvements that's what we want to see we want to see things to be better uh, certainly not worse but ideally better uh, thank you very much. Um, we, um, we're due to finish uh, now, uh, but given there's not a lot of questions still here, I think I might just uh, take the chair's prerogative to extend for another 10 minutes. So if, if our panel list are willing to stay for another 10, um, and those who don't have a, a, another meeting to go to, um, you're welcome to stay. So we'll, we'll carry on for another 10 minutes. There's a, a lot of questions. Um, I wanted just to turn uh, the question about public transport um, and um, e-scooters and also um, any emerging trends in the use of e-scooters um, in, in recent months. Um, Henri, is, are you seeing um, any differences in the way that e-scooters are being used in your um, schemes um, in, the, in the last few months? Yeah, so I fully agree with what Anthony uh, just said. Uh, there, there was the world pre-COVID and post-COVID. In the world pre-COVID, we saw, we saw a trend over 2019 of more and more uh, day trips and uh, average use per rider during the week around four at the beginning just one then two then three then four trips per week and so when we talk to these people in the streets of paris in Lyon, in milan they, they, they become part of their work life not just leisurely touristy uh, life on weekends in the world post covid uh, we think there's a huge bump uh, to all the scooters and e-bike providers across europe uh, because of COVID, we we see uh, I, I, when I personally walk in the streets of Paris. I was there last week. I talked to users, both on bikes and uh, scooters, personal or shared. Uh, they describe how they want to stay away from public transit for now, and they would take their personal car if they were allowed to. So, I, I, I would say there's a fair share of traffic right now on private bikes and shared services. That is definitely. Uh, I wish I could use my car, but I can't. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I've got a question here, which is uh, a slightly broader question. So in, in many cities, and in, indeed encouraged by government funding, there's been uh, improvements in bike lanes, whether it's temporary or permanent, and encouraging people to cycle as well as uh, walking um, rather than using their car. Um, we have seen some, and this is the words of the question uh, here, bike lash against temporary road changes. Um, and so th the may be, it may be that there's, uh, the political will may, may change in certain locations for the, again, using the words of the questioners, the stickiness of these measures. And the question is, how can we support local authorities to get through these difficult first months? And I'm interpreting that as, how can we have more of, more of this? And I might um, pose that one to, uh, to Conrad's first. Okay, um, so I think there's, um, Anthony will know this, that we've reviewed our entire programs in, in a post-COVID world, including the FTZ. Um, and during COVID, we saw a lot of uh, increased use in cycle share, um, not in our region, but sort of generally. Um, we were very mindful of the need for open air uh, transit. Um, we have done a significant marketing campaign, uh, looking at sort of developing people to carry on some of the positives that have happened of this and sort of seeing this as, this as an opportunity to change. And that's the approach that most of our local authorities are taking as well. So um, it's a big issue. It's not a, it's not a positive issue in any way, shape or form, but you've got to try and find the good in it. So there is a real catalyst for change. And I'm, I come from a behavioral background. So when you get those catalysts, you've got to take advantage of those. Um, so what we're trying to do, we've, we've done an entire marketing campaign, um, get, getting people to try and continue working from home. We've got the people try, getting people to try and walk more, cycle more, consider their, their environment more, which is something that has come out of this. I think we all have those thoughts and have those behaviours that have been developed. But we're also looking at developing infrastructure. I think all the local authorities, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's true of every, every other authority on the call, has put in temporary measures or brought forward measures that they were going to put in as part of wider schemes. So a lot of our TCF schemes have been put in interim um, in, in a temporary way, that, so to, they'll, they'll be made uh, permanent at a later date with a view of actually advancing the sustainable transport uh, agenda. Um, as much as we can during this process. There's always going to be backlash. You're always going to get pushed back. You've got to accept it. You've got to develop it. We've talked about behavioral change before, so I'm not going to sort of say all the things I said before, but you've got to work with people to help them make the choices that are in line with the requirements of, the trans of their needs in the transport environment. And so I think if we can just sort of uh, 
see what we can do to do that and make it see it's part of a bigger program it's not I think it was Henry that said it's it's it's, a, it's not just about the infrastructure it's about how we get people to use them we've got to start thinking about the the customer journey the behavioral change aspects how we're going to support that with marketing uh, how we're going to win people around okay um I've got one last question which I'm going to pose to everybody as I'm taking in turn um this is a crystal ball question i know how we like crystal balls um so imagine imagine the world uh, in x years time and we're talking like maybe a couple of years time two or three years time the trials are finished evaluation has been completed legislation has evolved and um, how is a typical uk city different okay i'm going to pose that one to uh duncan first well first i mean it will have e-scooters in it Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think ultimately it would be different because I think the space on roads is going to change an awful lot away from the car, particularly in central areas. We're already seeing that in um, in very, very built up areas where, where road space is being reallocated. Um, along with that, we'll be able to provide much better parking facilities for micro mobility generally. So scooters, um, bikes or whatever else may, may come along. So. Uh, we've got a lot of people to cover, so I'll be short. So ultimately, I think the, the road space is going to change enormously and um, provide a much kind of better environment for people to to, to get around on. Right. And Connor, any thoughts about, um, well, I can ask you, how's Manchester going to be different? Um, yes, I, I think, uh, like Duncan says, the biggest change is going to be in uh, the use of road space. So um, as uh, we talk about those um, pop up bike lanes and walking and cycling infrastructure, there's quite a lot of that in Greater Manchester. And yes, there have been some complaints. Um, but if, if we want to enact that permanent behavioural change away from reliance on cars, then we have to act, we have to try it. Um, so being quite dynamic in our assessment of that. Um, and, and I think what we need to do sort of speaking more widely is adapt how we engage with the public um, on how we change our road space traditionally we have these quite drawn out consultation processes which i understand some of us set out in law what we have to do but they're not very um engaging for the public so i think we need to get a bit better of how we engage local communities about how their local road space is used because the majority of people do want to see less traffic and cars they want to be able to get out and about more they enjoy having those green spaces we just need to make them feel like they're involved in that change and they can actually shape how it's um happening in their in their area uh, so yeah in terms of a few years time i think that the big change will be road space i think we will start to see less hopefully less reliance on cars uh, particularly as these schemes come about um, but now is really the time for us to sort of take the silver lining of covid19 and take advantage of these um changes for making the cycling and walking and hopefully make that more permanent. Um, Conrad, you haven't got one city, you've got a, a plethora of cities. Um, how does the Solent region look in a couple of years' time? Well, I mean, it, we're, look, we're hoping, and our reasons for doing this are at the present moment to relieve public transport, but also to reduce car journeys. Um, as I said, we are, our, our cities have got climate change emergencies, and we, we really want this to be another sort of arrow in the bow as it were um of sustainable transport it's got to be part of the solution um and we'd look for it to we'd see city centers with much less cars in them um and but not in a way that restricts people's mobility um that's not to say we're not we don't we're, we're against cars but the, the the appropriate place for them and some of the city centers aren't necessarily as adaptable or usable or as environmentally appropriate so i think we see this as part of the solution to managing transport and allowing people to travel as and when they want to um to meet their needs and get um and get services but to do that in a way that's environmentally friendly usable and actually convenient so it could be a lifestyle choice and i think that could we could see a real change in the way that the city centers adapt and start to look as a result of that Thanks very much. Um, Anthony, uh, you're looking at this from the slightly higher level from uh, across the UK. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I suppose that there's two versions of this question uh, answer. There's the kind of what do I really think uh, and what do I, what would I like to think? So let's, <laughs> let's be optimistic and what would, what would I like to be true? Um, I'd like, I, I think I'd like it to be as, as uh, girls have described that cities have made the case that the, the benefits are clear. I think there's a lot of um, kind of reaction to some of the kind of uh, road space reallocation work that's happened re recently. 
okay. which is, is probably more noise than substance. It's very easy to be noisy, um, but actually the evidence doesn't always support it. So I think okay. if we can, uh, if we can win the argument, then it, then I think transformation is is absolutely achievable. And if I just cite the uh, the the Prime Minister's national cycling plan that came out last week, you know, if we if we can head anywhere close to the trajectory that that sets out, then I think cities are going to look different. But they're going to look different because people want to live in them in places like that, and they're going to be economically uh, robust. This is this is not, these are not fripperies, you know. These yeah. getting around is an absolute fundamental to the the health of any city. So if we can show, if we can demonstrate to people that there are ways of do, getting around and and making cities work so that goods as well as people can move around and cities can function, there's no reason why they can't look like the pictures on the front of our future mobility urban strategy where the sky is always blue and there are white puffy clouds and everyone's smiling. So I think it's perfectly possible. But there's a lot of hard political yards to be done to kind of win, win the argument. Thank you, Anthony. And Henri, um, last words to you. Um, any any summing up remarks or uh, any any international cities where you think that uh, the UK could really really emulate? Um, I would say, just like Anthony said, one, it's possible, but then on top of that, it's going to happen. It's the sense of history. We are we are juggling with yes and no, ups and downs, but this is the direction of history. You just have to look at the past to understand where the future is going to be, and the future is coming much faster. If you Google photos for Amsterdam in the 1970s, you just go use Google and look at photos, look for Amsterdam 1970s. It's a city made of cars, cars everywhere, not a single bike. Google Amsterdam 2020. It's happening in London. If you, if you Google for Victoria Embankment, uh, I don't know, 2010, and look at for Victoria Embankment 2020, see how much, how many bikes, the bike lanes and everything, it's happening. It's happening in Paris. If you, it, with COVID, so COVID is obviously a terrible thing for everybody. For sure, it's a good thing for micromobility and it's going to accelerate progress. So you Google Rue de Rivoli, uh, I don't know, April 2020, and you Google Rue de Rivoli, July 2020, look at the change, look at the space, look at all these people riding, happy, their private bike, their share bikes, scooters, everything. So this is the sense, this is the direction, and it's going to happen. And we are just, all of us, going to make it. Great, well, a, a superbly positive note to end on. So on that note, I would like to thank all our panelists, Conrad uh, um, Haig from Solar Transport, Duncan Robertson and Henri Moissanak from DOT, uh, Anthony, Anthony Ferguson from DFT and Con uh, Chaplin from TFGM. I've been Matthew Clark from Steer, your chair. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.